Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world. Welcome to another special edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I am Lee Elias, as joined always by Mike Benelli and Christy Casciano burns and I am really privileged today to uh, introduce you all to a very special guest. Again, I said it's a special episode, practicing what we preach. Today, we are joined by Coach Matt Lyle. Matt is recognized as the Internet's most followed baseball and softball coach and has experience at literally every level, from Little League through college, through Major League Baseball. He's an author, a professional speaker, an incredibly active coach, especially during the pandemic with his online coaching workshops, his website, The Hitting Vault. So first off, Matt, welcome to the show. We're really excited to have you here today. Oh, thanks, Lee. I appreciate it very much. Excited to be on. Right. And we're excited to have you. And, and this episode is all about something that we've been talking about to the, the audience, which is parents, coaches, and kids, about the importance of looking at other sports, playing other sports, and learning from other sports. And then not just as athletes, but as coaches and as parents. We don't do enough cross-pollination, speaking with other people across the line, if you will, to learn. And what I found in my coaching experience and even my playing experience is the more I talk to different coaches from different sports, the more I learn. So that's going to lead us into our first question, which is there's a tremendous amount of science and talk within the hockey world that athletes should be playing more than one sport. Uh, first question is, is this something that's shared amongst the baseball ranks? It's kind of a that's kind of a tough question out at the gates to be honest with you because uh, I am all for it. Like for me in high school, I lettered in four sports, and so I played football in the fall. Then I ran into basketball, and in the spring I ran track on off days of baseball, and I played baseball. So I did four sports, and there was never a time I ever considered playing year round. Having said that, nowadays, um, like I think in general, we very much encourage multi sport athletes. I think one of the issues we're coming across right now is that, that you have sports that uh, as they get older, uh, we're seeing over usage because of multi-sports. So there's, there's, there's some crossover there in the sense of like, yes, we do want you to play multi-sports. It's like uh, as long as you possibly can, but right. you also have to have some parents have some savvy around, okay, are they still playing year round hockey at the same time they're playing year round baseball? Like that doesn't count <laughs> as a healthy multi-sport athlete. So uh, it, it's kind of a mixed bag now where back in the day we didn't have year round stuff as much. And so um, it's encouraged, but it also has to be pretty, you know, carefully monitored as well. Yeah. I know this is something that Mike and I talk about all the time. And Christy, you too. The hockey world has gotten intense with year round hockey uh, even the private lesson type training. So, Mike, I actually want to throw this to you because, again, Mike, Mike is someone who does coach year round, but is also an advocate of, hey, put the skates off for a little bit. Uh, you know, Matt, I think what you just said there perfectly, which is, yes, you should be playing other sports, but maybe not six sports year round. That could be overkill. Um, and again, I thank you for saying that was a great question to lead off the episode. We try and be hard hitting journalism here. But, Mike, I wanted you to comment on that, too, because you made some really great points there. Yeah, but, I mean, well, that's the whole idea, right? That was we, we all advocate for the kids playing multi-sport, but then all of us as individual sports don't allow those gaps in time for the kids to do that. So I think me, like my kids play baseball, my kids play lacrosse, my kids play soccer. They, you know, they go skiing, you know, but, I, and I, but, and, but, you know, they love hockey, obviously. And I think, I think that, you know, trying to find the way to allow your kids to have that rest, even me as a coach, I really try to find out what other sports kids play. Cause you see them coming from, you know, two hours of hitting practice and baseball, and then they're coming to the hockey practice. And then, you know, I joke around with the parents, but it's, it's not even funny. It's like, well, when did they do schoolwork? Like <laughs> when did they see the rest of your family? Like wh where does all that come in? And, you know, I'm not talking about a 17 year old. I'm talking about a nine year old. And so that to me, you know, we all say, I mean, I hear it in every sport across the board. You got, you know, you want to be a better athlete, be a better athlete, just play multiple sports. But then us as governing bodies, 
the people that are involved in all these sports need to find ways to give the kids those opportunities to do that. We even do it at the, at the national level, right? Uh, at, the, at the highest levels, we have our tryouts during baseball and lacrosse season. So what are you going to tell a kid? Don't, don't, you know, just come to the tryout, look at your best, but don't be on the ice for two months before tryouts because you should be playing baseball and it doesn't work. And it's it just, uh, you know, we, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the, the horse is out of the barn on this, but there has to be ways for governing bodies to work together to, to bring that back in. You know, Mike, you bring up a great point too. I wanted to jump into So th- this, I'm going to transition a tiny bit here, right? Because one thing I do want to focus on is the benefits, like the specific benefits of playing other sports. And one of the things that I found is uh, when I was playing competitively, I was shocked at how well my hockey skill sets transferred to baseball, whether it was the weight transfer during a swing, uh, tracking a ball, or even making split second decisions. Now, I'm not saying that a hockey player could just pick up a glove and a bat and just be a great baseball player or vice versa. Uh, But Matt, the question is for you. I've always been intrigued about how baseball coaches go about building kind of those specific skill sets. So again, in hockey, you know, we can break it down to the mechanical, we can break it down to the mental, we can break it down to everything. How do you go about that in baseball and softball in a way that maybe we could learn from to apply to hockey and other sports in general? Well, I mean, I tell you, I think it's, I think it's pretty similar across the board. Like again, I know I, I, my kids, I have five kids and they they've done every sport from, you know, soccer, basketball, lacrosse, all the things as well. And I, I think just the, the crossover in general, to, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, all four of us on this call and all the parents that tune in, like at the end of the day, we're parents of these kids who, uh, at the end of the day, when we, as we go through practices and games, like it's all about life lessons is dealing with adversity. Uh, you know, it literally is sports is a tool to teach life and life lessons and all of the things. And so everything that you have to deal with in, in life, adversity, communication, love, trust, relationship, like you name it, it's in the sports that we do. And so if, if the coaches are doing it right and teaching it right, the crossover, uh, you know, across every sport is, uh, is the same. I think if we're talking about skill set. I mean, I'll tell you what the, 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 uh, I had one player many, many years ago, high school player that was like one of the best hockey players in California as a freshman in high school, but he was a better baseball player, just an incredible athlete. And learning, I, learning more about just the movements of the hockey swing, it is very, very, very similar uh, to the baseball swing in the sense of, of the movements, the sequence. Uh, you know, if, if you were to watch a lot of the, like Mike Trout, for example, or some other people and put them frame to frame versus somebody on like a, um, on a penalty shot, uh, you would see like their movements are very similar. So th- yeah, I think the skill sets are very similar as well. Yeah. I've always enjoyed, I, I remember the first time not to tell a quick story, but I, I picked up the bat and I, I, you know, the guy said, well, you have a natural swing and I, you know, whatever that meant at the time, but I could hit. And I remember thinking at that time, now this was a little later in my teenage years. So I was very focused on my hockey career at that time. But I remember thinking at that age, like, man, I, w- well, I wonder what would happened if I picked up this game. You know, I really enjoyed baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you, you also alluded to something um, that I want to jump into, which I think is really important. And, and I think it's one of the most underrated skill sets of really all sports, but baseball especially. And that's the mental game. Um, and at the plates, you know, you, f- you fail more than you succeed. Right. And the only the only position really in hockey like that's goaltending in a way where, you know, you're going to get scored on. Right. It's it's inevitable. Right. But you fail more than you succeed in baseball. Uh, hitting a ball is probably the hardest thing to do in sports. I think that's pretty that's pretty well known uh, as a common uh, understanding. The games can be long. You know, it just demands every aspect of mental focus. Now, my question to you is how do you start building these mental aspects at a young age and then moving forward? You spoke about love. You spoke about communication. Uh, we've said this on the show before. We've had other guests. They are incredibly important and by far the most valuable assets at the youth level that you pull from a game. So how do you do that in baseball and softball? I mean, I think for me, the biggest thing is one communication, but to me, it all is rooted in the, uh, 
ability for parents to communicate that two things, one permission to fail and understanding that, Hey, you know what? Like the best players in the world who play in the Olympics go on to play in major league baseball. Like they fail 70% of the time. And, and these are the best at it, at it in the whole world. And, and so communicating really quickly, like, Hey, you're going to fail a lot in the sport and it, that's okay. And, and, and I think that we live in this world where parents have a hard time when our kids fail and they don't communicate that very well. Uh, and so they're on their kids all the time to perform at this level and at whatever level their expectation is in their head. And then when they don't uh, fulfill that expectation, parents are make it harder on the kids. And so uh, communicating that. And then two, for me, I think as I, in my experience, kids uh, will tell you when you interview them a lot, they will tell you if you really get down to it, that they feel like their parents love is predicated sometimes based on their performance, that when they perform well, dad or mom treats me better after the games or this and that. And when they don't perform well, they get treated differently. And I think that every parent, when they're interviewed, say, oh, my kid knows that I love them. And, I, they, and they know that. And the, the kids are saying something different. So to me, there's a disconnect there. And so again, it kind of boils down to communication. For me as a parent, I've ne I really need to tell my kids Number one, hey, you're gonna fail. This is really hard, and it's okay. Like, and you're gonna fail and fail, and guess what? Like, you're gonna get better at it and get better at it. And as long as you can deal with that failure, and I'll help you with that, you know, you'll be okay. And secondly, hey, buddy, if you if you you know perform terribly today, uh, you know, I wouldn't use that language, but <laughs> if you don't play your best today, like we're still gonna go get ice cream after the game, or we're still like it, it doesn't. I, Parents have to actually say to their kids sometimes, hey, I just love to watch you play and don't worry about, uh, you know, how I'm going to, what I'm going to say or something like that. And to me, when you allow to give that freedom to the kids for that, that's where I see it growing versus, you know, it, everyone here on this call has seen the other side of that. Uh, and so, to, you know, in a long story, that's kind of the two things that stick out to my mind, permission to fail and communicating uh, that, you love your kids no matter how they perform. You know, I, I want to throw to Christy here too for a minute because I think that, you know, we, we've had other guests and, and, and to be fair, that's a great common theme amongst the top coaches that we've spoken to is to tell your children, no matter what happens, I love you. It's not, I'm not basing my love for you off of your success or failure. And Matt, I think that's phenomenal. You know, I want to throw it to you, Christy, because um, Christy, so Matt, just so you know, the listeners know, Christy's uh, children are in college or out. Mike's children are in the middle of their youth career. My kid just started. So we have parents here from every aspect. Uh, we have coaches from every aspect. It's all over the gamut. But Christy, your daughter uh, just uh, received a really prestigious um, standing uh, within her college. I want you to explain what that is. But what I love about this, and this is why I'm bringing this up to everybody watching or listening, is that your, Christy, your reaction to this, uh, how proud you were of her, really emulates, I think, what's important about the sport. Because again, Christy's Daughter is a collegiate hockey player. She's very good. But Christy, why don't you go ahead and talk about it and we'll explain like your reaction, why I think that was so special. Well, uh, she got selected as a Del she plays division one hockey. And um, there is a sense that the hockey culture needs to change. It needs to be more inclusive. Uh, it needs to be more welcoming. It needs to draw in kids from all cultures and how do we do this? Because a lot of times, if you if you look at hockey teams, there are not a lot of children with color. There's not a lot of diversity. So they want to change that culture. So there's a whole uh, group of D1 hockey players who got selected to represent their division and their area. She's in the Northeast. She's in the um, uh, New England Women's College Hockey. And they meet once a week by Zoom. They can't meet, obviously, because, because of the pandemic. But they're coming up with strategies. What can we do as individuals? What can we do as a group to make hockey a better place for everybody? And it, we're only going to get better by including everyone. Yeah. So I'm real, I was really proud of that because it wasn't how much she scored on her team. They're not playing. Their season got canceled. Mm. Um, but I'm just as proud of her doing this as contributing to the sport, um, not through the scoreboard, but in really a long lasting um, impact that's gonna affect generations to come. I and mean, this, is, this is gonna change the future of hockey. It's gonna be hockey for everybody. Right. How could you not as a parent be proud of that? 
But going back to our topic is when they were little kids, we were never focused on, oh, you need to play this sport because this is going to help your um, stick handling skill. Or you need to play this, this sport because this is going to help your speed. You need to do track because you're going to be faster on the ice. We let them dictate what they wanted to do. We never forced anything on them. And we made them understand that if you're going to do this, you, you got to realize you got to put hockey on the back burner in the summer if you're going to play baseball. You can't do both. It's one sport per season. And they got that. Um, like my son, Joey, he, he loved hockey, absolutely loved it. But when spring came around, he was ready to pick up the baseball bat and be with his baseball buddies, a whole different set of kids, which I also love because it got him outside of that hockey circle and kids with different kind of mindsets and mentality and interests, which only benefited him. I liked him to have, you know, well-rounded all friends from all different walks of life and from different communities because the baseball teams all came together. It wasn't just, you know, one town baseball team which I loved. And I always let them drive what they wanted to do. <laughs> and if they picked up extra skills, great. If they didn't, that's okay too. No pressure. Yeah, Christy, I think that's a great point I'm too. I'm sorry. Am I bringing you down? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I, no, that's, I, I, that, that, I thought that was yeah. great. That's, that's, that's kind of the goal for <laughs> when I talk to all these parents, it's literally what I'm trying to get them to do is exactly that and create an environment that they actually – choose themselves what they want to do and so instead of the parents uh, in the driver's seat that's that's perfect right and it worked because my son you know chose not to you know pursue collegiate hockey but here my daughter is d1 hockey so you know it does work yep. if you let them choose and let them have fun and know what they can handle and you know explain to them at a very little age what your commitment is and what sacrifices you're going to be made you're going to be making by making that decision as long as they have a full understanding and you're supportive and you're having fun with them. And I loved when I could sit outside with, a, <laughs> with a lawn chair and enjoy some sun instead of bundling <laughs> up with 10 blankets and freezing under a, a heater at the rink. It was a nice break for us too. Yeah. I don't know if Matt knows too much about being in the rink in the cold with the coffee at 6 a.m. He probably knows a lot about that being outdoors though, but you know, Chris, it's a great point you're bringing up about being the guide for your children. You know, yeah. one of the best pieces of advice I ever received as a parent, uh, hey, my son just turned seven. That's my oldest child. So that's how long I've been a parent for seven years. But one of the best pieces of advice I ever received was, you know, they're not your property. They're not you, you know, they're separate whole human beings and you're, you're serving as a guide for them you know, uh, on, on their journey. Um, and, and, you know, that really kind of opened up my eyes to the, the possessive nature of parenting. Now, obviously it's not that simple, but the idea is like you're saying, you let the kids choose, you can serve as a guide. One of my biggest fears, I'll share this with all of you. One of my biggest fears um, with both of my kids, because, you know, they both kind of want to skate and play hockey was I, I said, I don't want them to feel like they have to do this because this is what I did have done and continue to do. I want them to make the choice. Now they, they want to do it, which is great. But I'm not ever trying to put myself in a position of you have to play. You have to play. You know, it's if you want to play, that's great. You know, but that was that was a hard kind of thing to wrap my mind around. And then there's the balancing act with it. Is, is he really enjoying this or is he just doing it because um, he knows I love it? Now, again, he's seven. So there's probably a little bit of both right at, at this age. But I'm just trying to serve as a guide for my kids on this journey, because, Matt, as you said, uh, the life skills, and this is, this is what's hard for parents a lot of the times. We are going to talk about parents later in the show, but th this is what I find is hard for parents a lot of times is, you know, A, you have to really discover is, is your kid living your dream or their own dream? That's kind of number one, right? It's, it, it can be very hard to discern sometimes, right? And then number two with kids is, are you allowing them to kind of find their own way, Christy, as you just brought up, all right, right. And, and get those life skills? Because it is well known, <laughs> Whether your kid goes pro or not. And again, I've never told a parent uh, or a kid, hey, you're never going to make it. I, I, I just, I don't believe in that, right? I always tell parents and kids, look, you have a right to your dream and you have a right to pursue your dream. That's kind of my statement, right? But I never say you'll never make it or there's no point of trying. But I do say you do need to learn these life skills just in case, right? Especially when you're 16 years old and sports are all that matters. And it is well, well known that, uh, people that come into the workforce or come into society having played sports have an advantage 
over kids who don't play, I should say team environments, right? They're not in team environments. It doesn't have to be just limited to sports, right? Um, so Matt, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on that just as a parent and as a coach about the life skills that come along with playing sports in general. It doesn't even have to be just baseball that can be applied. And that's going to lead into another question for me. Well, I think right now that the biggest challenge that we have uh, in youth sports that has changed in probably the last 15 years is that right around their freshman year, uh, as they get into high school and, and really they travel ball and, and like travel organizations are really starting to, you know, at the peak of it all. And yet you, you have rankings. I mean, baseball, softball, we have 12 U rankings and of players and teams and probably even lower 10 U. Uh, who knows? And um, the problem that we have with that is that when they become these freshmen, the travel ball and all these, you know, all the hype and the rankings, all stuff is that the parents and the kids to a degree make that journey about the scholarship or the pro, you know, whatever the destination is that they make it about that. And so, but what the real point of like high school sports and, and that level is about the life lessons. And so what happens is a lot of parents, they decide, you know what, we got to get a scholarship. We, that's the goal. We are, or whatever the thing is, hockey, the Olympic team, junior development team, uh, whatever the goal is, all right, now let's, we're all in it for that goal. And then not realizing that the best players at the next level are really good team players and leaders, and they can deal with really hard adversity and all the things that come up in life. But parents and the travel ball coaches forget that that time of life, that it should be focusing on that. Uh, the focus has changed. So for me, um, all the life lessons of, uh, like I said, dealing with adversity, being a leader, being a good teammate, working with others. I mean, the, the list is so long right. that they, those get pushed off to the side because I need to get ranked higher on the rankings or a better team or I need to win this tournament. Uh, and so you're, it's so focused on whatever the parent or the kid decides is the goal that all of those life lessons uh, get pushed aside. And then we have these division one athletes or beyond who get to that level and then they don't realize that their skill set is, uh, is not the only thing that the best players have. They right. also do other things or they, they can deal with the mindset and all these things. And that we have these, a, a ton of kids who get to that next level unprepared for all of the things that happen. Like you know, she's talking about her daughter being a D one athlete, D one athletes in their the amount of school that they have from the weight room to the, to the tutoring, like, the amount of work that division one athlete puts in to, to be able to even be on the team is incredible that uh, most kids are not even prepared for that unless they, you know, unless they've had a good upbringing and good coaches and good organizations that have taught those things. Otherwise they get to that level and they get slammed by all the academic expectations, everything else. And so uh, I think, I think that's kind of, that's the biggest challenge that I'm seeing right now with uh, the high school age kids. And, you know, right. and for us, it always see. was yeah. academics first. Academics always came first. Um, that was so important because that's going to open more doors for you than anything. And, and, parent, and parents seem to forget, and the kids do especially, that I, you know, I've coached college in the SEC, the Pac-12, uh, high division one schools. I've, I've coached all the way in the NAIA, is that when we evaluate athletes, like, of course, you want the best players. Don't, you know, like that's, there's no uh, hiding that. But if I'm looking at a 4.0 student versus a 2.0 student, that what that 4.0 student doesn't tell me just that they get good grades. That's I mean, it does. But it tells me that they can handle – like they, they, they work hard and that they are willing to put in the work to do that. And to me, a 2.0 student, like there's always going to be, you know, there's things and challenges in life that could be a cause of that. But it it's also tells me about their work ethic. It tells me about uh, I can depend on them for responsibility, you know, all these things. And so uh, parents and kids sometimes forget that the, the great point average, which is very, very important. It doesn't just tell the story of their grades. It also can tell the story about the kid and their responsibility, their, you know, work ethic, a lot of other things as well. You know, Matt, as this is a cross sport episode, uh, Nick Saban mm -hmm. just said uh, in this off season, a great quote, and, and I'm probably paraphrasing it, but he basically said, if you've transferred to four or five different high schools, I don't want you at Alabama because you don't have what it takes to make it at one school. Now, obviously there's some give and take with that statement, but the, the, the idea behind it is very true is if you can't deal with adversity, why would you want to play at the top football college team in the nation? 
for him. And I thought that was really important that he said that, you know, I volunteered at a local inner city uh, high school in the city um, uh, football team. And it's funny because we always talk about winning being defined in different ways. You know, it's a very competitive high school football team, but at that level, in that environment, just graduating high school is the win, right? Mm -hmm. Surviving the city is the win. Um, and, and of course they're interested in scholarships, but the team to them means survival. You know, it's a totally different mindset and how they run the sports. And, and, and it goes to show you that from hockey to football, to baseball, to basketball, everything, there's so much that can be done. Now you, you did team me up, uh, no pun intended for this next question. And, and I always love asking this question of experts, um, especially people that have worked in the places that you have worked. Um, one of the things we talk about with parents on this show a lot is, you know, how they know, they know what they need to do to get their kid to the pros. Right. And you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, you know, um, is that, we want to get clear insight on the professional level. A lot of parents and athletes aspire to be there, but their focus is often on the wrong thing, right? Oh, my kid can hit the long ball or in hockey, my kid's the fastest skater, biggest slap shot, hundred thousand points. So this is the question. All right. And I think th th these answers always surprise our listeners. What do you think are the three to five common traits among top level athletes at the pro or collegiate level? Right. Because I'm going to guess it's not just the ability to hit a baseball. Right. There's plenty of people that can do that. There are things that combine to make someone a professional athlete, and they are probably common amongst all sports. What do you think those are in baseball? I would say the first thing is that like we hear the phrase a lot, especially the college level beyond or just in general, like trust the process. And to me, like trusting the process is like kind of the bare minimum. I think for <laughs> the athletes that I the major league baseball players and pro players I've worked with uh, they, they distinguish trusting the process over to loving the process. <clears throat> what I mean by that is they actually enjoy doing the boring stuff. And I think like, I look, think back to me as a kid, like I, there were days I would throw the tennis ball against the garage door at a little square for like an hour and had a great time by myself doing that. And like, uh, and so I made these things fun where I, I know some, uh, some of my own kids, I'll throw them under the bus. Like they, I have to rip the, the Nintendo switch or the PS4 controller out of their hands and, and go kick them out to the backyard, do some work. And so I would say that like, the best athletes out there, like they actually love do like they love the game and they love working on it. They, and they're willing to do like the stuff that's like, Oh, I don't want to do that. They're still going to do it. And right. that distinguishes them a little bit. And, um, I, and I would say the mindset part is a really big piece. I, I think that I've come across a lot of division one athletes that I've coached that on paper and on video, like they're great athletes. They're, and then they get to the level and just their mindset is just, they can't, they've never had any adversity. They haven't dealt with a lot of uh, stuff and they get to this, that level and they, and they realize they're not the best player on the team. They're the 10th best player on the team uh, that some of them have a really hard time. So I think just the mindset uh, is, the, is another one. Uh, and I just think that, uh, again, like they have a, they have a discipline to them, to their, to the, to the game that other people just don't have, where they just, they just show up when they don't want to, when they're tired, they don't, uh, and they have the mindset we talk about a lot with our athletes, like, I get to go to practice today instead of the mindset of I have to go to practice. Right. And it's been a while since I coached high school, but I used to always, I used to always listen for athletes when they would say like, uh, talk to their girlfriends or friends. I'm like, Oh, I have to go to practice today. I'm like that mindset. Like when you say I have to do this to me, uh, that tells me that you don't really, that's not really what you love to do. But if you were to change it to like, I get to go to practice today or, right. you know, something, something Gratitude. like that. I just, that just, it's just those little switches that from the mindset standpoint that you see that uh, athletes that they, they just really love it. And I think, um, you know, that, that to me, those are the kind of the biggest things that stand out in the athletes I've been around. Well, and, and Mike, I'm going to throw this to you in a minute too, because you, you know you're going to have some thoughts on this. But I, 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 Matt, I just want to impress upon our listeners what you just said. And again, you are not the first person we've asked this question to, but the answer is always very similar. He is not saying the ability to hit a fastball. He is not saying the best fielding in his sport. He's not saying the best pitcher. He's saying discipline. Being uh, showing gratitude for having the ability to play the sport, the type of person that you are, the person that wants to do the little things, which I understand. I love that. I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, you know, a savant with the minute stuff of hockey and the tactics. That's what separates the people at the top level from the people that don't make it. Now, he has also said, and I will also say, 
you must have some comparable skill level <laughs> to make it. So that, that is important, but it is not the be all end all. And there are plenty and everyone on this call knows this. And, and Mike, this is what I want you to comment on. Uh, there are plenty of unbelievably talented athletes that never make it just based on their mentality, their work ethic, or their capacity to work with other people. So, Mike, I want to toss this to you because, Mike, you see a lot of players go through the New York hockey system. You've seen some go all the way. You've seen some not make it. But I just wanted to comment on what, what uh, Coach Matt just said uh, from a hockey standpoint. Yeah, but well, so I think a lot of that's coaching, right, Matt? I mean, I, I use the analogy all the time that, you know, you never hear – like when you were at a baseball field, like I used to hate, like I, I'm from the ADM world of hockey and, and the station based, you know, three kids in a group, four kids in a group. And then I go to the baseball practice and I got nine infielders and the, and the, and the all-star high school dad, you know, hitting them grounders and then screaming at them because it's going between their legs. And then, you know, my kids over there picking his nose saying, I, I don't even know I was up yet. I mean, I didn't even get the ball to me. So, and I look and I try when I, in my coaching programs, I'm always, I'm always trying to say like, well, have you ever heard a kid at the playground on the monkey bars ever be like, Hey dad, is this almost over yet? Like, are we leaving soon? You never hear it. Why? Because they're having a, a, an absolute ball. And Great I think analogy. we need to, you know, we need to find a way to, in, you know, inspire the kids in our practices to fight Nintendo switch and to fight Fortnite and to fight those things. And, and you know, I see your social media stuff and obviously a lot of people in your world that do this all the time that, you know, are seeing this and I, and I kind of get jaded, right? Cause I see it all the time. It's almost, almost too much information. I'm like, don't you, you know, how do you not see this? So I think, you know, going to Lee's question, I mean, one of the things I'd like to hear is, you know, how do you, cause baseball really, and hockey's getting this way more and more is how do you combat the private coach, the coach that's telling the kid he's the best hitter, the best bunter, the best fielder. And then he's in a team environment and, and baseball is a little different, right? It's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one game in essence, mo a lot of the times, but you know, we see that in hockey where a kid is a great cone practice player. He's got a great skill, you know, stick handling through a lot of different obstacles, but then he gets thrown into a situation where there's another player actually competing against him. And he goes, Oh, well, that cone's never moved when I, when I'm in practice. <laughs> so I understand, you know, how to react to that. And I think it's the same way now I'm assuming, you know, I know like in baseball, you know, that, that the fundamentals of hitting off a tee and hitting off a tee and hitting off a tee is like parents. Like, no, 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 no. My kid needs to see curveballs. And, and I think, you know, just, if you can, you know, just talk about that a little bit from your perspective and softball and baseball is, you know, where does that, the world from the private lesson coach telling your kid he's the best player, how does that incorporate into the team concept? Yeah, for me, it just it, boil, it really boils down to, at the end of the day, like parenting and parents and, and being involved in the journey and like, and again, and communicating and talking and not just picking them up and dropping them off to things. And I know like my mom was, old, my mom had seven kids and we all played, every one of us played college, except for my brother who has down syndrome. And like, I look back and she like, she couldn't, she wasn't super involved because she literally was driving one people to the next. But I would say that like parents have to find ways to uh, contextually like have conversations around that. And so like I, the most, the most emails that I get, or DMs from parents when it comes to like hitting specifically baseball, softball is like my kid does great in the cages and doesn't perform well on the field. You know, how do I fix this? And a lot of times it, it, it really is a mindset thing, but the difference is like at practice, we're competing, we're challenging, we're trying to, we're trying to create this competition and in the cages and the, and the private lessons, there's not a lot of competition. There's a lot of hugs and high fives and feel goods. And, and so it's, it really depends on you know who they go to for this private instruction stuff. But uh, I think it's the job of the parents to like, they've got to talk with their kids about this. Like, Hey, uh, and, and with, you know, for me, if it's my kids, doing private instruction, I'm going to talk to the private instruction coach, like, Hey, are you creating you know, competitive environments in this, in this thing? And I, and I might say to them, Hey, you know what? I, I need you to not, not to be hard on my kid, but to again, create some competition, create some adversity for him to work through in the lessons and not just, you know, high fives and feel goods. And so, and I have done that. I'll tell you like my nine-year-old son, uh, and just been coaching for a while. Like I I'll tell, I'll tell the coach, Hey, you know, you do your thing, but I also like want you to know, like, here's some things about him. And, and I want you to try to push him in these ways and, and, and try to figure some of those things out. But uh, I think, yeah, it's a really hard thing if they, if they only work in that environment. And so you were talking about the practice situation to me, 
I would, if I'm a parent of a, of a hockey or baseball, softball, anybody, uh, when it comes to the private instruction thing, like that's why I love group settings, group lessons, uh, group practices, small groups, because even if you have a two or three other kids in there, like you've, you have a little bit of a competitive culture, you've got a little bit of that. Uh, the one-on-one model is great. I just don't think it should be like your main go-to uh, model for development. Yeah, but I also think just to, to, to you know, just to add on that too, is that we, what we see, and I, I see in baseball a lot, is that the, the private coach in a hockey doesn't speak to the coach that's with that player for seven hours a week for 25 weeks a year. And then that the deficiencies that the coach sees aren't getting fixed because the parents like, no, 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 his private lesson coach, who I'm paying $120 an hour for, <laughs> said he should be on the first line and should be playing all the time. I'm like, yeah, but he, he, he's not playing within what, we, what, what I do. So how come he's never contacted me, the person that's with them all the time, and I see, you know, I've seen a, a lot of NHL skills coaches. The, the great ones are the ones that communicate with the coaching staff right. and communicate with the player's agent and, and, and the player and, and the whole group saying, well, what are the deficiencies that are there and how can we fix them within the team? Because it's great that you can hit the long ball, right? But if I need you to bunt in, in situations and you have no idea how to do that uh, because you've never been taught it and, and it's a, a skill that you're very weak in, well, then it's, it's not going to really help me win, you know, win baseball games. Yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I work with a lot of Major League Baseball players in the offseason, and I've been doing it for about seven years now. And I will tell you, uh, 2018, so, you know, four years into it three, and three years ago was the first time I ever got a call. Boston Red Sox called me and said, hey, I know you work with this player, and we'd, we'd like to talk to you about it a little bit. What are you working on? Like, and it wasn't like a uh, challenging me, like, hey, we know you work with him, but we like – we want to get on the same page. That was the first time that had happened in four years. Uh, uh, and, and I real, and so we started having conversations with other teams like, Hey, you guys understand that like, like when you cut these major league players off in, in September, October, and they come back in February, like you're just, you're just letting them go. And then they come back and you're expecting X, Y, or Z, you know, why don't you come up with a plan and communicate with people? I, and I would say that the same thing, like when I talk about, uh, to high school baseball and softball coaches. And they, they, they come to me and say, Hey, how do I deal with a kid who goes to see private lessons and goes against what I'm trying to teach? I'm saying, communicate, find out right. who that coach <laughs> is and call them and say, Hey, well, you know, I want to, and for, for some reason we, we get like territorial over kids right. uh, in regards to like, I'm the travel ball coach or I'm the high school coach or I'm the private lesson coach. And it's like, they claim stake to these kids instead of like, actually caring about like what's best for the kid. And so uh, I just don't understand why parents uh, don't get on this. It, it takes, you know, an email thread or a text thread or a phone call. I'll be like, Hey, you know what? Uh, my, my son's going to this instructor and they've been working on this every week. Just wanted to let you know. And right. And get, like that would be the best for the kid is that there's some communication there. But for some reason, at least in my experience, the it's more of like an ego thing of the high school coach saying, well, it should be, I want it done my way. And, right. and then the travel ball coach is telling this and, and instead of working together, it's like, Oh, they get territorial over it. And, and to me, that just doesn't make any sense. I would love to see the paradigm shift a little bit in the sense of communication between coaches. And I think it really just comes to a posture too. Like if I call, if I'm a, tri- if I'm a private instructor coach and my kids on a high school team, I would just call and say, Hey man, I just want to introduce myself. I, I work with Johnny every Monday and, and he's a pitcher and this is what we've been working on. Just wanted to share with you what we've been doing. And uh, if you have confidence in what you're teaching and like, I think it's really, and I think a high school coach would appreciate knowing like what you're doing and how you're doing it. And, and, you know, they might not be uh, the best, but at least you've made an effort to do it. Yeah. And it's a better business model. I mean, it's just, you know, why be an adversary, you know, be, be, be on the side of the group that you want the kids from. And I think that's, you know, and then to your point is, you know, I said it all the time. Like, why are you working on one-on-one drills with a cone? Like, work with another player. Find somebody that has his skill, somebody that's in his ability level. You know, maybe that's, you know, back to Christy's point. You know, I uh, earlier with what your daughter's doing, I do that with players now where I bring in a player that probably can't afford a private lesson and bring them in in a situation where a kid's paying me already and I can now help that other kid, but they're all helping each other. Right. And because not, you know, you see it in all these sports that the kids that are, uh, you know, progressing are the ones that have, all this access and then we eliminate all the other access and, and, and as a business model, it's hard, right? It's, it's hard to say, well, how do I look away from that, you know, six or seven kids that are paying me a lot of money for being, you know, 
being philanthropic a little bit and trying to help a kid that can't. I can say this too, guys, that, that, uh, this is not a problem that's limited to just sports, right? So uh, we all know I do a lot of I do a lot of team building. That's that's one of my main jobs, one of my main offerings. And it's funny, no matter where I go, if I'm in an office setting or a sports setting, I'd say nine to ten out of ten problems are based off of poor communication. Almost every time, it's just poor communication. Matt, you you alluded that ego plays a huge part in this, and it absolutely does. You know, one of the things, and, and we've talked about this on the show before with hockey parents, and this, this will actually segue us into the the final questions, uh, is that hockey parents will find an instructor, and then they don't want to tell anybody else about it because they think they found a secret that nobody else knows about. <laughs> and it's just, you know, that's it, always been one of the most amazing things to me. And again, hopefully if you're listening to this episode, you, you've realized that like actually the ability for your instructor to speak to the coach is actually an asset, a major asset. But it's funny, like you, you think you found something that no one else knows about and then they hold it tight to their chest. And it's it that logic actually does not make sense. You might in, inadvertently, I'm not saying this directly, but you might inadvertently actually be hurting your kid by doing something like that. And then, uh, you know, Mike's told the stories before about how two kids on the same team show up to the same private instructor and they didn't even, Oh, I didn't know your kid was going here too. Oh, how did- <laughs> and the whole time, the whole time they're like, right. no, 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 we're not, we're not, well, we're not, we're busy that night. We're busy that night. Oh, okay. Right. And then you show up, you're like, you're, you're, you're getting a lesson with this guy. Right. You know, well, cause you're taking my kid's spot. And I think it's just, and again, I get it. It gets me, it becomes territorial. And I think, uh, you know, me, you know, uh, Matt, as a parent coach, you know, I, I almost feel like, what the hell am I giving everybody all this information for? I said, I want my kid to be. <laughs> but everything I'm doing, I'm like, guys, you got, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting. My son is, you know, unfortunately, my oldest is like, is my guinea pig on trying things like different training tools and, and these different kind of, you know, ways to learn how to balance or juggle. And then I'll use it on him and say, okay, it's working, it's not working. And then let me, let me give it to everyone else. Cause I think it's right. just, that's our obligation as coaches is to, you know, find all that great information that that's out there and, and take it and, and give it. But, you know, I, 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 I can, I can understand the territorialness of a parent uh, for sure. And I think one, one of the things that when you say that, I, what I hear and I try to tell travel ball coaches and parents in general is that understanding that in the microcosm of that, like team uh, or that, when that situation happens to understand that if all of your players we're going to that lesson guy and everyone was working on development and everyone was getting better, even though you may not like be the, the star anymore on that team because everyone, but because the level of everyone is lifted up that when you do practice and when you do play, it is helping everyone right. get better and it's helping your son get better. And, I, and it's hard for parents to realize that because they want their kid to stay above, uh, you know, the great, the curve a little bit and understand that, you know, I would tell you uh, it's changed a lot. It's really weird now, but in, in softball specifically, baseball too, what has happened in travel ball is that the best travel ball organizations in the country, they do all the recruiting for college coaches as it is. So like at the very top level, every player there is like all division one athletes and the college coaches can just go watch those teams play. And the 14th best player on that team is signing a power five conference scholarship, even though they're not the first best. Uh, And so that that's kind of help that has helped there. And so it's gotten rid of a little bit of that stigma of like, you have to be the best player on this team that by playing on a better team and this better team moves up, but it is, it is very difficult uh, for parents to think that, okay, everyone around me is getting better. uh, That that's a good thing. Uh, They they want it to be, they they get threatened by it. uh, And I get totally get it. I just would encourage parents to, to think that if everyone around you is working on development and getting better, it's helping your, your son or daughter get better. And, I think um, I want to say Scotty Pippen. Someone there was a, there was a talk one time in the NBA about just how the those guys made the bet. Like even LeBron will talk about some of these players that made him better uh, because right. of who, and vice versa. You know, yeah. one of the funny things I tell uh, my students sometimes is I'll have a parent or a kid. Well, how do I become a great shooter? And I always say to them find the best goalie. And then I'll have a goalie say, how do I become the best goalie? Find the best shooter. <laughs> All right. Because if you want to get good at scoring, you got to learn how goalies think. And, you know, I, I've coached teams where we've had the best goalie in the league and I've specifically made drills. Now, I'll speak to the goalie ahead of time just because probably he, I need to let him or her know that they're getting peppered. But I'll, if we have the best goalie in the league, I'm going to do a lot of shooting drills for that goalie. Cause as you said, everyone gets better. And it was, it was clear. Our team got much better at scoring because they were always shooting on the best scoring, the best goalie. So when we got to games, no goalie was as hard as our own goalie. 
Uh, now, that was a gift, to be fair, to have the best goalie. But that, that it, it goes to show just the, the nature of athletics. I mean, if you go back, you go back 100 years, they didn't get private lessons and get to do What did they do? Uh, that Man, they worked in the meatpacking industry, and they had to swing an axe at a piece of meat 55,000 times a day, and that's how they got their swing. You know what I mean? Like, that's probably not the true example. But, like, that, you got to go back to the roots here. I mean, and Esposito brothers in hockey – used to talk about that. They would just go outside with a hockey stick and play with a tennis ball. That's how they learned to play hockey. There was no private instructor. They played with a tennis ball outside their house. <laughs> you know? Um, so I want to transition to the last topic here. So Christy, one of the reasons I, I asked you to bring up your daughter earlier, uh, and, and, and Matt, I want to paint the picture here because I, I love this. When, when this happened, when her daughter got that station, uh, we all got texts from Christy and her <laughs> pride was shouting through the text. And I loved it. Right. I'm the type of person. If she's happy, she's proud of her kid. I'm proud. Right. And, and Christy is just someone who really, really gets it from a hockey parent standpoint. She understood that the, the stuff surrounding the game is more important than her game and her children are emulating that. Right. But that brings us to the, to the last point, which is parents, just parents in general. We always try and talk about parents on this show. We've done it already. So, uh, Matt, your book uh, is called well, one of your books, right? Dear Coach, Real Emails for Parents Behaving Badly on the Field at Home and Behind Their Computer Screens uh, dives right into this topic. And again, we've had a lot of conversations about parents on this show and have created actually several episodes focused on uh, tips for parents and coaches to work better uh, together. So I have two questions for you here. All right. One is please share with us your favorite nightmare parent story. And then what is your advice overall uh, to parents, coaches, everybody, just to make the experience more enjoyable? My, my favorite, my worst nightmare path. There are so many. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, what year, there right? There was one year where there was so much competition and this was on the high school level for the goalie position. The, the goalie who got picked to represent the high school in the, in all the games, the second string goalies, parents actually started harassing that parent oh. would bring a laser to the game you're kidding me no seriously i didn't know this story to That's try horrible. and blind the goalie <laughs> to the point where this these parents had to put restraining orders on the other pair that's this is a true story it. that's probably true story that's probably wow. the worst example <laughs> that's um, horrible that's horrible yeah they had to get restraining orders because these goalie parents were so jealous and so crazed and wanted this kid to fail so badly can you imagine being that yeah. goalie on the team and be like, someone's shining a laser in my eye? And it, that's horrible. That's horrendous. That's a nightmare. Yeah, that's, Jeez, I, okay, that's the worst example. But there are a lot of other, there's so many examples. I mean, fights in the stands, you know, parents, uh, kids on the ice doing obscenities to the crowd because they don't like the fact that they got kicked off the ice. And yeah. There's so many bad examples. Um, fortunately, the good examples far outweigh those few <laughs> instances that we've had um, where parents are just out of control and ridiculous and so obsessed with it, wanting their kid to succeed on the ice so badly to the, I mean, to the point where a restraining order had right. to be in place to, uh, that's insane. Yeah, uh, it's out of control there, there, for that. some some parents um, who I think they I don't know. They drink the Kool-Aid and they just lose their minds. I'm not sure, Matt. Are you probably <laughs> seen it too? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that's honestly, that story's not that surprising. Like I've, I feel like I've heard that one a few times. It's like, that's how, just how I, I just, again, I, I don't, I just don't realize like how you get to that point that like, that's like this decision making in your head. Like that's, that's the way you do stuff. I mean, there's, I have so many stories like that. And in my dear coach book, there's actually is a hockey story about these parents. And I, I can't remember the exact story about um, them, but there's a story about like changing the website, trying to change the website uh, roster. And like tr they're trying to hack the website and to change like roster stuff. I mean, it was, they, it, oh. it was really crazy. You're, but See, they're just getting into it now. You, you, you wait young man oh, with yeah. your young hockey kids you <laughs> fade <laughs> no it's yeah terrifying. i mean it's, you're but in for, for some fun for me there's so many stories in my dear coach book just like that and to me the very first story is one of the is to me the funniest one where it's like 14 u soccer and the kid gets taken out of the game like and the coach says within like 60 seconds 
He's on the sidelines yelling, and the kid hands him the cell phone out of the kid out of the kid's bag. And he, he's like on the sidelines talking, and the mom is on the other sideline screaming at him to put him back in the game. And he said that he could hear her across the field just as clear as he could on her on his cell phone. On the so the kid went into his bag, got his cell phone out, talked, like called his mom, and the mom on the other sidelines got on said you know give the coach the phone and was yelling at the coach uh on the phone in the game to put her son back in the game and but while he also was like looking at her across the field while she's screaming at him to put her kid back in the game yeah exactly that's kind of stuff when i I was when when i'm looking at all you guys writing your books i was telling lee earlier you know i'm I'm going to write the book on the emails that i get on the amount of time uh, the, the, on Monday mornings, how I get these emails that my kid got way too much ice time was double shifted all weekend. And I said, well, I haven't gotten one of those yet, but when I, but I will go in the book, I'm like, I got to get the emails that my son missed, you know, in the second period with three minutes left, you pulled them off 15 seconds earlier than the other shift. And I, I said, you know, and I think that goes right back to, you know, and I, and I, in, in a lot of ways, I blame myself when it escalates that much, because I, it, it comes down to communication, education. And I think as coaches too, we forget it's a constant run of communication and education. It's not like in hockey, it's not September that my email goes out about behavior in the 24 hour rule. And then we just don't reinforce, you know, and then it's just, it's, right. it's, it, people just get caught up. And I think, you know, I'm experienced that, you know, in hockey now we're coming to the end of our season and it's just, you know, you, you always want to end on a good note, but everything escalates and you start hearing, well, this has been happening since September. I mean, well, I, you have to tell me, I, I can't read your right. mind. You have to let me know, you know, you know, in that kind of stuff. So I can see that book getting written and I can certainly, I've heard the Christie stories, you know, uh, just, it, it, they are horrific, but I, I think in all our podcasts, we always try to, you know, at least, you know, the, on the good side is there's many better stories than these, than yeah. these horror stories. Yeah. You, uh, you it, made it, me bring that horror story up. Oh, like, I blame that, you. Listen, that you I can like blame me all you want. People, positive. I hope people had the same reaction that I did to that, which was, I can't believe that, right? But I, I mean, I like I played long enough to see some of my own things. Uh, you know, I want, I want you both to know, Matt, Matt you shared, I, I believe it was you, you shared this great picture the other day on your social media. Uh, by the way, if you're not following Coach Matt Lyle on social media, please do that, whether you're hockey, baseball, or anything in between. It's something you want to check out. But you, you shared this great picture of the catcher walking up to the mound <laughs> and the pitcher is saying, all I'm saying is I'd appreciate it if you come and tell me I was doing a good job once in a while, too. Like, don't just come out here when I'm playing bad. I thought that was one of the most telling I, pictures I'd ever seen. And I thought that, like, yeah, it's, it's got a deeper meaning to it. It's hilarious, but it's got a deeper meaning. And that, that's going to bring us to our final question, which is we talked about these horror stories. Let's talk about some solutions, you know, uh, at least what what to be done now. I don't ever hold any reservation the, or the thought that if a parent's shining a laser in another goalie's eyes, I'm not, I'm not dumb enough to think I'm going to be able to change that person. All right. That's, that's just the type of people that they are. But I will say that anytime a parent goes too far, you're typically not making it about your kid. You think you are, but you're actually making it about you. All right. And you're teaching your kid something horrendous. Right. Uh, And, and that's what I want to focus on at the, to just round out this episode is that it's really hard. I got to say this to all the parents because, you know, Everyone will go, well, that's not me. I don't do that. And I catch myself doing that every once in a while. I'll be, it's, it's minor, but we're all guilty of it. It's at one point or another, we want the best for our kids. All right. It's a good thing, but you can take this way too far based on your story. You just told me, Christy. And, you know, Matt, I just want to, again, to close out the episode, I just want to get your thoughts on, you know, how parents can approach any game. And obviously it's not just baseball, keeping that in the back of their mind so that their kids, and this is the key, right? Get the most optimal learning experience athletically, mentally, physically moving forward for the rest of their lives. For me, it's really about trying to figure out for your kid, what is best of my communication style? Like, I know I tell you my almost 17 year old son, he is the, I know, I know, I know dad, I know. And I'll tell you like, you know, maybe he, 10 years ago in the car on the way to his baseball game, trying to tell him something on hitting. And he's like, I know dad. I know. I'm like, Chappie, do you know that I am one of the, you know, top hitting <laughs> coaches in the country? I'm like, trying to, I'm trying to convince my 10 year old son. Like, do you understand that? I like know what I'm talking about. And so, uh, but my nine year old son, 
like, I, like he likes to, he loves to talk, 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 sometimes a different thing. So if I can get him to start talking or ask the right questions, I can get, so I think for every parent and it's difficult, I mean, I, every parent knows it's hard sometimes, basically, especially as the older they get, and especially teenagers, uh, but trying to find out to them, like, what do they, enjoy, what's life giving about the sport? What do they really enjoy? And, and again, like trying to kind of piece things together for them so that when they are playing or when they don't, uh, like what is their, what is their goals? And, and because it's really funny because if you talk about goals and expectations with parents, it's always their goals and expectations. I never really ever get to hear actual high schoolers uh, goals and expectations. So my, my question to, to them is like, hey, what is your goal? Like, what do you want? Is it just to have fun? Cool. Let, let, let me just, you know, if that's, if that's the case, like you don't want to play in college, uh, you don't like, you don't have any goals of being the best player on the team. You just want to go out and on the weekends and play and have fun because it's just because you enjoy the social aspect of it. Cool. Let me help you. So like support you in that. And then let's make that, the, let's make that the thing. Uh, but if, if my son says to me, Hey dad, uh, cause this happened about a couple months ago. Uh, he said, Hey dad, you know what? I'm the worst player on the team basketball and uh, the kids don't pass it to me. And so my conversation with him was like, well, what do you want to do about it? Like, are you okay with just going still and playing doing that? Or does that upset you? Do you want to work on getting better? Like, and so like when you, when you approach it in that way and the kid that, that way gives the kid a little bit of ownership and a little bit of thought process of like, okay, I'm not the best player of the team, but I do want to be on the court. I do want to touch the ball more. I do want to get more shots. Okay, buddy, if that's your that's a goal of yours, do you are you willing to do what it takes to do that? And what that means, buddy, you have to go, you're gonna to have to go practice some dribbling, you got to practice some shooting, and like I'll help you do that if you want me to. But if you're saying, you know, I really don't want to do those things, next game when you don't get the ball passed to you and you don't like play and you're not, you don't just have to understand like that's part of it. And some of the kids on your team, they're, they're practicing so that they can do that. You're creating and I think when you can, when you can approach it that way and have conversation around it, make them, make them take some ownership and some goals. I just think it's way better than just a parent saying, okay, go out there tomorrow and shoot a hundred free throws. And I want you to go dribble for 45 minutes and I'll time you. And, and, and when you make it about like the parent's journey and what their, their goals and expectations are, I just haven't seen that succeed long-term. You know, uh, and, and the Mike I and, and Christy, that, uh, you said that beautifully. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you guys the final word as well. You know, I, I always love to tell this story, Matt, because I think this, this story, I use this now myself. Um, and it's shocking to a lot of people, which is, I remember I used to shoot, um, 500 pucks a day in my garage every day. Uh, my father had told me, you know, if you want to be good, you got to You got to shoot and shoot and shoot. And I got to a point and I was a, probably 15, 16 years old, maybe a little younger. And, um, I used to want him to tell me to go outside and shoot for whatever reason. And I, I would push him. I'd fight. I know dad. I know dad. Sound familiar, right? And I remember this. He, this was to me like one of the most brilliant things my father ever did. He came up to me one day and I was, I was fighting him on it. He looked me right in the eye and he said, Lee, he goes, if you want to make it, you want to be good. I won't have to tell you to go out there and do it. You'll just do it. Right. And it just hit me between the eyes, the way he said that to me, but he didn't push me to do it anymore. He said, I'm actually never going to tell you to do it again. If you want this enough, you'll just do it. And, and the lesson was given to me there of like, wow, do I want this? He put all of the ownership, as you said, and accountability on me. And in that moment, I realized how much I love doing it, right? And it took away the parental aspect. And I realized that was one of the biggest gifts my father ever gave me. He also told me before every game, I always love saying this, before every game, he told me, I don't care what happens in the game. I love you no matter what. It was one of the most powerful things I could have ever heard growing up. I never feared uh, making a mistake because of that. And I made plenty. Right. But to have that safe place after a game is invaluable. Um, Mike and Christy, I want to throw it to you, too. And then and then we'll close this up. Hey, Matt, you've given us so much time today. I appreciate it. I, I do want to ask you about Star Wars and Marvel stuff, but this isn't the show for that. We'll have to do that another time. So, Mike, go ahead. And then, Christy, I'll let you finish it out, too. Yeah, no, it's, it's like I said, it's right. It's right in the wheelhouse here. I think of a lot of things we talk about. And I, I experienced that with my, you know, I have a, I have a 13 year old and a, and a seven year old. And it's it's very they're 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 funny conversations because. I, I say the same thing. Like, you know, you really gotta, we gotta work on shooting and you gotta, you, and I, and I know somebody that can help you with this. So I said, you know, <laughs> and he'll be like, Oh, who coach Hughes or something like that. Like, no, oh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going to kill you. You know? So I think, I think matter of, you know, but I, but I do, I do, you know, really try to, I know as a parent coach, I really try to put myself in a situation where, you know, I, I want to make sure I, I, I present that to all the kids that I'm working with. Like, and I want to, I, I think as a parent with a player now, you know, I, I, you know, to, to, 
to a lot of stuff you talk about, uh, Matt, is that, you know, just we're, we're communicating to those kids the way we want a coach to communicate to our kid. And I, and I try to really remember that and, and yell at him as much on the bench as I yell at anybody else's kid. I think, you know, and sometimes I, I forget to do that with him. Like I'm not getting on him. And it's just because I, I'm like, well, I'm getting on him in the car. I'm getting on him at home. Uh, but, you know, just finding those things. But I think your, your stuff is brilliant. And a lot of stuff you do, you know, as far as the, the parent education and player education, I think is, is definitely something to follow. And, and, I, and I do think it, it, it spans all sports. It spans math. Spans, you know, school. You know, so I'm not the first. You know, I'm not calling like when when my son's having a problem in school. I'm like, well, he's it's not him, obviously. And I'll say it all the time, like, oh, this teacher's, you know, she's she's the worst. I'm like, well, you better learn how to, you better learn how to deal with her because she's your teacher. You ain't going anywhere. So I think that's you know all good lessons that we can learn through through athletics, whether it's baseball, hockey, lacrosse, whatever it is. Yeah, and I think it's really important too for parents to encourage their kids that if they do have a dream, don't let anyone tell you you cannot do it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, be there to support them. You don't have to be that overbearing parent to, and you know, make sure they get every lesson that's going to get them to their dream. I mean, let them dictate what they want to do, but also be there for them and 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 give them hope and say, yeah, if you have a passion for this, I'm going to help you get there. And I think, Matt, you're a perfect example of that. You've had so much adversity in your life. My gosh, we didn't even get into your personal story, but it's pretty incredible. I mean, at one point you were homeless, but look how you didn't let that deter, define you. You overcame that. And um, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your inspiration. And it's a great lesson for all of our children to learn, too that you can overcome adversity and achieve those dreams. And you don't have to listen to all those naysayers out there. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I would just say my kind of advice on that is that, you know, I think that everybody here, you know, throughout throughout their life, you're going to face some serious adversity at some point. And I think just having the, I think sports helped a lot with that. Just understanding that, Hey, you know what, like, there is, there is success on the other side, whatever that looks like. And there's joy on the other side. And I mean, the same thing with COVID and the pandemic and everything that's going on. Like there is, there is a better day on the other side, even on our, on our worst days. And, and so for me, I, I think I always held on to that. Uh, and maybe I thank my mom for that uh, growing up. But I, I, again, as parents, I think that's, that's kind of one of our jobs is to let our kids know, Hey, like, there's going to be some hard days at some point and it's going to be some, and it's going to be, you know, you're not going to like some of the stuff that's going to happen to you, but just so you know, like on the other side of it, there's, there is joy, there's family. I'm here for you, all the things. So that when those, when they're in those moments, they know that there's going to be, you know, there is, it, it doesn't last forever. I, I, I don't know who it is, man. I think it was, I've read a book about, I know, it's about the Navy SEALs and they'd say something like, Hey, you're not going to die. Like th- this is like as hard as it is right, right now, like tomorrow you're going to wake up and you are not, this is not going to kill you. And is it, even if you, even if, like a lot of them talk about like in their worst moments of Navy SEAL training, it's like, they just, they just, they think they're going to die. It's going to be, there's nothing worse or harder than this. And they've, they have to like tell them you will survive this. Like tomorrow you will wake up and this is like, this is the worst it's ever going to be. And I, I think for as parents and, and just in general, uh, we have to, approach some of this even like you know I, I come across you guys do two athletes who like they go through this spurt where they play terribly for a couple of weeks or a weekend it's like they're devastated by this they want to quit the sport they what you know and all these things and it's like they have to be reminded sometimes by loved ones like yes like it, this this is part of it, it it's you, you got to go to the rock bottom sometimes and like or to these desperation tough places and in those places, you know, we get refined in the fire and come out the other end. And it, it's, it's difficult for people to, when you're in it, to picture that, obviously. So, well, I, I'm not going to even try and follow that up. I, I think mean, that's actually a great place to, to end the episode. Uh, uh, Matt, I want to let people know where they can find you. Obviously, CoachLyle.com. That's L-I-S-L-E. Uh, obviously, check out the Hitting Vault if you're into baseball or softball. Obviously, follow this man across social media. Uh, he is well-known, to say the least, across social media. Whether you are into his sport or not, 
please follow this man on social media. He did not ask me to say that. I am telling you, it's a treat, <laughs> right? So uh, thank, you, Matt, thank you so much for being here today on Our Kids Play Hockey. Really appreciate it. I think we accomplished what we wanted to, which is, again, just talking cross sport. I learned a lot. I think everybody listening learned a lot. So for Matt Lyle, for Mike Benelli, for Christy Casciano Burns, I'm Lee Elias. Thank you so much for watching this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Check out this episode and other ones on ourkidsplayhockey.com or wherever podcasts can be listened to. Thank you so much, and have a great day, everyone. Take care. 